Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 2. Right now, it's winter here in northern Illinois, and that means there's lots of snow on the ground, and ice on the streets and sidewalks. Today I want to tell you all about one of the ways we help to keep the roads safer on icy days. It ties right in with something we talked about last time, colligative properties. As you might remember, colligative properties are four phenomena that occur when we form a solution by combining a solute with a solvent. To refresh your memory, what makes a colligative property different from other properties is that they depend on the concentration rather than on the identity of the solute. The four colligative properties are vapor pressure lowering, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmotic pressure. In the last video, we talked about the first of these, vapor pressure lowering. When we did, we found out that it didn't matter what the solute was. The vapor pressure decreases just as much regardless of whether the solute is glucose, sucrose, codeine, or anything else. What does matter is how much of the solute there is. In other words, the concentration of the solute does matter. Today, I want to tell you about two of the other colligative properties, freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. As you'll see, these are actually very similar. Imagine what happens when we cool down a liquid. The molecules move slower and slower, and eventually they're so slow that the intermolecular forces between them cause them to stay in place. When that happens, our liquid has frozen, and it's become a solid. But now, suppose we dissolve a solute in the liquid. Now the solute molecules will get in between the solvent molecules. That means the intermolecular forces that would ordinarily form between the solvent molecules will be disrupted. The intermolecular forces won't occur at the usual temperature, which means that we'll have to get our liquid even colder before the liquid can freeze. This effect is called freezing point depression, and it's a colligative property because it depends on how much solute we add to the solvent. The more solute we add, the more the intermolecular forces are disrupted, so the colder the liquid will have to get before it freezes. Here's an equation that describes the freezing point depression. Delta Tf is the change in the freezing point. On the right are three different variables. I'll take them in reverse order. M is the molality. In case you've forgotten, this is one of the new concentration units we looked at in video number five. The molality is the moles of solute divided by the kilograms of solvent. So this shows us that the concentration of the solution affects the freezing point. Kf is a constant that depends on the solvent. So every solvent has a different value of Kf. You won't need to memorize the values for Kf. If you need one in a problem or on a test, it'll be provided for you. The last thing in the equation is I, which is called the Van Hoff factor. This one takes a second to explain. As you learned in the General Chemistry 1 course, there are two types of compound molecular compounds, and ionic compounds. When they dissolve, these behave a little differently. Take sucrose, for example. Sucrose has the formula C12H22O11. Those elements are all nonmetals, which means sucrose is a molecular compound. When molecular compounds dissolve, the molecules stay in one piece. So our reaction looks like this. If we start with a million sucrose molecules, we're going to get a million dissolved sucrose molecules. On the other hand, suppose we dissolve sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is an ionic compound, which means that every molecule will break apart into ions when it dissolves. In the case of NaCl, that means we'll get sodium ions and chloride ions. So sodium chloride produces two particles when it dissolves. But think about our freezing point. When we try to freeze a solution, what matters is how many solute particles there are. But as we just saw, a mole of sodium chloride produces twice as many particles as a mole of sucrose. That's what the Van Hoff factor takes into account. It's the number of particles that a solute forms when it dissolves. So, for sucrose, the Van Hoff factor is equal to 1. For sodium chloride, it's equal to 2. Here are a couple more examples. Consider potassium phosphate. This is another ionic compound. When it dissolves, we get three potassium ions and a phosphate ion for a total of four ions. That means the Van Hoff factor is four. 
How about copper 2 nitrate? This one's another ionic compound. We'll get a copper 2 ion and two nitrate ions. That's a total of three, so copper 2 nitrate has a Van't Hoff factor of three. Meanwhile, ethanol is C2H5OH. Since all the elements are nonmetals, this is a molecular compound, which means it doesn't produce ions when it dissolves. That means the Van't Hoff factor is one. The Van't Hoff factor was named after the Dutch chemist Jacobius Van't Hoff. He studied lots of properties of soluble compounds, and he was also the first person to propose the idea that molecules could have tetrahedral shapes in 1874, which is something you learned about in General Chemistry 1. His work was so important, he was awarded the very first Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1901. So, let's try a problem with the freezing point depression. Suppose you add 30.0 grams of sodium chloride to 100 milliliters of water. What's the freezing point of this solution? To find out, first we need to know the Van't Hoff factor. As we just discussed, the Van't Hoff factor is 2, because sodium chloride breaks up into two ions when it dissolves. Kf is the freezing point depression constant. This is different for every solvent. For water, it's 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Finally, we need to know the molality. As you learned in video 5, this is the moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. We have 30.0 grams of NaCl. From the periodic table, we find that this is 0.513 moles of NaCl, so that goes in the numerator of our formula for the molality. For the solvent, we have 100 milliliters of water. Since the density is 1 gram per milliliter of water, that means we have 100 grams of water. That's equal to 0 0.100 kilograms, so we'll put that in the denominator. And that gives us a molality of 5.13 molal. We put that molality in the equation for our freezing point depression. That gives us a result of 19.1 degrees Celsius. But be careful, that is not the answer to our question. The question asked, what's the freezing point? But what we just calculated is the change in the freezing point. So the freezing point is 19.1 degrees lower than it would be without any solute. Pure water has a freezing point of 0 Celsius. So with this amount of salt, the new freezing point will be 19.1 degrees lower, which is negative 19.1. By the way, the Van Hoff factor can help you make a good choice when you buy salt to melt the ice in your driveway during the winter. The reason why salt melts ice is because of freezing point depression. As we just mentioned, water usually freezes at zero Celsius, but when we add salt, the freezing point goes down. That means it must get much colder before the water will actually freeze. In the previous problem, the new freezing point became minus 19.1 degrees. That means if the temperature is anything between 0 and minus 19.1, adding that amount of salt to our ice will cause the ice to melt. If you buy a bag of salt for your driveway, it'll tell you what kind of salt it's made of. It's not always sodium chloride. Sometimes it is, but some brands also use potassium chloride, calcium chloride, urea, or some others. Since we talked about the equation for freezing point depression, you can now see that some of these are more efficient than others. For example, as you know, NaCl has a Van't Hoff factor of 2. So does potassium chloride. On the other hand, calcium chloride produces 3 ions when it dissolves, so its Van't Hoff factor is 3. Meanwhile, urea is a molecular compound, so it has a Van't Hoff factor of 1. That means you won't need as many moles of calcium chloride to produce the same freezing point depression. In that case, you might wonder why you'd ever want to use salt made of urea. The reason is that urea is more environmentally friendly. It'll take more urea to melt your ice, but it's not as bad for the soil as salt is. Well, just as a solute will reduce the freezing point of a liquid, it'll also increase the boiling point. This phenomenon is known as boiling point elevation, and the equation for it is almost the same as for freezing point depression. Here it is. 
Delta Tb is the change in the boiling point. I is the Van Hoff factor, and M is the molality, and these are the same as in the previous question. Kb is a boiling point elevation constant. Just like Kf from the previous equation, it's a constant that depends on the solvent, and you won't need to memorize any of these. You've actually used this phenomena if you've ever cooked pasta. You might remember that you add salt to the water before you boil it. The reason why you do this isn't just to make it taste better. Adding salt to the water makes the boiling point of the water go up, which means that the water will be able to get hotter before it boils. That means the pasta will be cooking at a higher temperature than you could get if you just cooked it in plain water. That's going to give the pasta a better texture and it makes for a better meal. Let's try a problem with this. Suppose you add 30.0 grams of sodium chloride to 100 milliliters of water. What will be the boiling point of this solution? This is just like our previous problem, except we're going to look at the boiling point instead of the freezing point. Just like last time, the Van Hoff factor is 2. Kb is the boiling point elevation constant. For water, that's 0.52 degrees Celsius per molal. Finally, we need the molality. It's the same as it was in the previous problem, which is 5.13 m. We put that in the equation for a boiling point depression, and that gives us a result of 5.34 degrees Celsius. But be careful. Just like last time, this is not the answer to our question. The question asks what the boiling point is, but we just calculated the change in the boiling point. So the new boiling point is 5.34 degrees higher than it would be without a solute. Pure water has a boiling point of 100 Celsius, so with this amount of salt in it, the new boiling point will be 105.34 degrees. Well, that's enough for now. When we talk again, we'll look at the last colligative property, which is osmotic pressure. It's an especially important one for living cells, so we'll want to look at it in a little detail. I hope you'll join me for that. In the meantime, have a good week.